So hello, everyone. Um, just like to welcome you guys to our third race and educational inequity, uh, I mean, a third social justice forum. Um, and today is race and educational inequity. Um, over the last uh, several months, as you guys have seen, we have put ourselves in position. Um, we have put ourselves in position to uh, run these separate forums that will really talk about specific injustices in America. Um, and so we've created this. Uh, we started doing this. Um, we started doing this immediately after the George Floyd incident. So our first, um, our first in, uh, was June 4th, where we had a, um, a social justice forum that had nearly 200 people to attend. While those individuals attended the forum, we, we spoke about um, our experiences as um, black and brown people in America, um, as minority groups in America, and what we've had faced over, over periods of time, whether it be in work, or whether that be in education, um, whether that be you know in, in you know police harassment or brutality, um, so we shared our experience, and that was a powerful, powerful, powerful um, forum. And then on um, July second, uh, a month later, we had a forum that we did policing, um, criminal justice, and race in America, which was extremely powerful there as well. But we had um, police chiefs from various um, departments come to speak to us about um, what they're doing in their particular areas um, and how are they looking to kind of be a little bit more transparent and also be able to um, look at ways that we can kind of solve some of the issues that they may be having within their departments. Um, so that was extreme. Um, it, it was extreme. It was powerful. There was a lot of tough conversations and questions that we had, but it really brought us to where we are now. Now our third, um, our third uh, justice series here is um, educational inequity. And what's great about this particular one is we're bringing a lot of our educators to the, to the floor here to really speak about our classroom um, experiences, our administration experiences, and how we can really look to create better and safer spaces for our students. But we have to kind of really chime in and break down what that really means as educators and as administrators in our areas. So today we're gonna to talk, about, today we're gonna to look at K through 16. Um, so we're gonna have educators and, and special guests from elementary school all the way up to higher ed four-year colleges. Um, the purpose and the reason why I wanted to do this was to really connect the community with our different leaders who understand social justice within their classrooms and really have a, a bunch of tactics and solutions and actionable items that you, as the viewer, may be able to use in your circle, not just in your classroom, but also in your areas of work professionally that this stuff does cross over. So although today our focus is really um, educational inequity and how that looks in our classroom settings and our K through 16 system, however, a lot of this stuff, as we, if you attended our other forums, you would realize that um, influencing your circles can also take in other areas, just as a lot of our police chiefs and, um, and therapists did in our last um, episode. Uh, we were doing that now um, for this particular one. So where do we begin and how do we do this? So please note, all right, all trainings in multicultural affairs, social justice is happening this summer and fall and in our introductory. Uh, this means that we will familiarize the audience with specific topics. So you're not, we're not in two hours, we're not going to be able to solve everything, please, um, but it's going to be a series where we're gonna be able to, to give you guys more and more information as we move along. Additionally, um, I have an understanding that workshops and trainings will be offered um, as, we, as we continue and moving forward. Next slide, please. Order of events today, obviously I'm doing a welcoming right now, then I'll go over a brief history of education and equity and then show you a, a short video. Then I will have our panelists, which is more like an open forum today, um, town hall kind of. Um, it's a little different because we are virtual and we're not live. So I will be um, calling out a, um, a panelist, going over their bio, and then I'll ask them uh, questions that I have prepared for them to answer. And so that, that really pertains to their areas of expertise so they can really um, speak on their experiences. Then from there, we will um, talk to our audiences and our audience will be able to give a a Q&A um, for our panelists. 
and you know wherever that may be doesn't matter um, you know what jobs you're in or where you are as a student or maybe if you are an educator yourself you may be able to ask some questions to our, our panelists and then we'll end up with next steps actionable items um, so our panelists have prepared some of those for us that we can take and use on our everyday um, professional experience and then we'll have our closing remarks um, a couple of rules just to kind of give a, a heads up as our panelists are speaking i'm going to go through all of our panelists first we do have a robust um, group uh, of panelists here so i won't be able to um, you know go over every little line that we have in the bio so i will share their bio um, in our group chat so look into the group chat and you can follow along we also will have our timeline in our group chat so follow that along i believe melissa may have emailed that to you already so you have an agenda and so if you did sign up you did have an agenda and it should be there um, once we go into uh, once we go into the uh, the panelist section and I and they start to speak if you have a question that is okay but I will not go to your questions until every panelist has spoke first and and we, when we get to that Q&A section so just be aware of that so I'm not ignoring you um, if you do have a question just please do that also if you do have a question privately and you don't want to speak you can send me a question and I will um, repeat that question to the group as a whole um, if you don't mind speaking, just put comment or question, and then we will call you or call upon you in order. Okay. Other than that, let's let's get going. So, the history and timeline of race and educational inequity, uh, we can go back into the 1800s, and I'm not going to read all of this to you guys, but I'm just kind of you know you'll be shared to you in your in the chat, so take a look for it but understanding of where it's come from. So, so we've looking at it in the 1800s, where it began. Next, next slide, please. One of the major cases that we understand here is Roberts versus the city of Boston in 1849, where the Mass Supreme Court ruled that local officials had authority, um, had authority to control local schools. Um, so it also said that, and they ruled that separate schools did not violate the rights of, of black students. And from that, you end up seeing black parent, the first organization of black parents um, that were doing boycotts and protests has started way back in um, 1849. Next slide, please. Plessy versus Ferguson is, is a, another case that you look at a Supreme Court struck down civil rights of, um, act of 1875, finding that discrimination by individuals and private businesses was constitutional, um, which became a huge major issue um, in America. Next slide. And again, I'm not reading through all this. You'll have this because we have a lot to get through with our panelists. Um, and then here you can see there's several more. Um, one of the most popular ones that we know of, Brown versus the Board of Higher Education, uh, was a unanimous decision, was overturned by Plessy, declaring that the separate schools are inherently unequal. Next one. Also, um, the Little Rock Nine in 1957, over 100,000 um, uh, paratroopers from, uh, from the 101st Airborne Division and federalized Arkansas National Guard uh, sent to protect uh, nine black um, high, school, high school students integrating into Central High School in Little Rock. And if some of you remember these imaging of the students who are anywhere from ages 14 to 16 or 17, um, trying to uh, walk into a school and exercise their rights to do that. But you saw the military um, lying side by side with a, um, a bunch of individuals who were white, yelling, screaming, spitting, throwing things um, as these students were just trying to walk into the school and the military was there for assistance. Next slide, please. And then again in the, in the 1970s and 80s, here's some, um, as you guys will get the slides in a second, you can kind of look through it, but these are a lot of the different cases that were carried on in um, the civil rights and educational rights. Next, please. And the timeline here, and, and I kind of want to just go on to 2003, again, so in the 90s and the 2000s, these things have continued and they still continue today. But in 2003, a study by Harvard's Civil Rights um, Project find that schools were more segregated in 2000 than in 1970 um, when um, busing segregation began. So that was pretty, pretty major. 
So what I'm going to do um, from here, and I know some of you are saying that you, you're not able to see the, um, you're not able to see the slides. We, you will get it in the, um, you will get it in the, in the comment section, but we'll play you this video. Hopefully, let me know if the video does work and it's embedded that we can see it, and then we'll go from there. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African American and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, Owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low-interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university. The same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white-sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black-sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. 
Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. Awesome. So that video there, again, I think it ends of us all having a role to play. And part of us creating these forums and having these uncomfortable discussion is for us to kind of really see where our roles are, no matter where we are. Um, I think there's a lot of times in education, we put ourselves in a position where that's not really me, it's up to administration, or it's up to the director of multicultural center or the director of the women's center or whatever center it may be to handle something or the director of multicultural affairs or diversity, chief diversity officer. Um, you know, those are things that we kind of assume and not realizing that it really affects who we are. I don't care if we are a teacher, a coach, um, frontline, if we, you know, we're uh, an administrator, it, it all affects who we are and it affects our students and how they progress and how they see us at the elementary level all the way up to um, the college level as well and beyond. So um, that was a short little video that I you know, hope you guys like it. We will um, share that as well with you. I apologize for really rushing through the beginning part of it because I really wanted to kind of just have us see the timeline. Um, so I know it wasn't as clear, um, but you guys will also have this um, for, you, for your use as well. So I do apologize if, it, if I kind of blasted right through that. As I'm reflecting, I, I kind of apologize for that. Um, so let's begin with our panelists. Uh, we, the reason why I kind of wanted to rush through everything is because I wanted to hear about a, hear our panelists more so um, than hearing me. I think the last few um, the last few forms you heard a lot of me, and I want these professionals to really speak and who are doing this work day to day um, as well. Um, and today we have a special guest that I wanted to introduce to you guys first is, is Kevin Gannon. Um, and Kevin Gann is the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning um, and professor of history at Grandview University in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, he is, um, when I say we had a great conversation the other day, um, if you guys have not known him, he's con um, was called the Tattooed, uh, he's called the Tattoo Professor. Um, and he was in a great documentary, uh, which is the 13th documentary, uh, directed by Ava DuVernay. Um, and he also wrote the book that just was released, The Radical Hope of Teaching Manifesto, published by West, um, uh, published by West Virginia University Press in 2020, uh, spring of 2020, um, as part of their teaching and learning and higher educational series. So, um, so again, I would like to welcome Kevin. And Kevin, I have a question for you as we, as we uh, you know, you just wrote your book. So since the release of your book, uh, Radical Hope, a teaching manifesto released uh, this past spring, how do you define hope in education now with everything happening in America? Yeah, that's kind of the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, first, let me just say thanks for in inviting me here and for letting me share space with you all today. Um, it's it's a, a, an honor and a privilege to be with you. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I think we need to really think about and be careful when we conceive of hope as something like just this vague sense that everything will get better. Because what we do is if we if we just sort of blindly believe everything will get better just over time, then that takes away our own role in making the change, right? That, that we assume someone else will make everything better and that we just have to sit back. And so for me, when I think about the, the idea of hope, what, what hope demands, or to, it has two important elements to it. You can't have hope if you don't have agency, that is the belief that you can help bring about the circumstances that you're hoping for, and pathways. That is, what are the ways in which I can actually take to, as an agent, to bring about this change that I'm, I'm looking for? So when we ask students to be hopeful, you know, we want students to, to know what their agency is and know what their pathways are, right? And so part of that, I think, involves a really honest reckoning with the circumstances we find ourselves in today. Uh, it does no good for any of us to ignore any of the systemic inequalities, the, the corrosive effects of racism uh, that have, that have uh, suffused the structures that we, that we live in today, uh, you know, from everything from, you know, access to resources to, you know, which students are seen as important and which students aren't and whose knowledge counts and whose knowledge doesn't. Uh, you know, we need to have a clear-eyed, honest, unflinching assessment of where we are today, a realistic understanding of it. And here, when I say we, I'm mostly talking to white people, 
you know, fellow white people, it is very easy for us to take the off ramp on this conversation. You know, we can, we can be in spaces where everybody looks like us and everybody's experiences are similar to us. And if we don't uh, do the work to do this realistic assessment and, and get a critical understanding of where we are now, then we don't have hope to, uh, to take a positive approach to change in the future. Um, so the, the agency uh, to, to build that understanding brings us uh, an understanding of the pathways that we need to take. And that may look different depending on your role, whether you teach in the K-12 system, whether you teach in a college or a university, whether you're a student uh, in one of those areas, whether you're a, a citizen who wants to you know, work for more equitable education funding, wherever you are, realistically and unflinchingly looking at our situation and then say, where is my pathway? How am I an agent for change? Those to me are the, are the critical ingredients of hope. Uh, hope has to be realistic, right? And I'm not saying we can't dream big and I'm not saying we should limit our vision, but we need to have ways to get to the type of change we want. We shouldn't be afraid to dream big, but we also shouldn't be you know, afraid, you know, we shouldn't be dreaming big and then assuming it's somebody else's job to do the actual work. Uh, so if you remember anything out of that, you know, hope and agency, you know, or, or, or agency and pathways make hope. So where, what's your agency, what's your role, what pathways do you work for for change? Uh, and then, you know, how do you get about doing that work? How do you make it part of your responsibility as well? Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, that's a great way to open because that kind of really has to start thinking in our professions, especially a lot of us do identify um, as, as white. And if you do identify, like, how can you, how can you be that, how can you critically think as, uh, and follow some of the guidelines that Kevin just um, spoke about? Um, so thank you, Kevin. We'll get back to you uh, shortly as well. Um, Amy uh, is our next, um, Amy Dos Santos is our, is our next uh, presenter. And Amy received a bachelor's degree in psychology from Bridgewater State University and master's degree um, in elementary and special education from UMass Boston. Um, Amy worked as a child development specialist at the Tom Boston, um, at the Tom Boston Metro uh, Early Intervention. Uh, program for four years and currently works in Randolph Public Schools as a kindergarten teacher. Um, before her position as a kindergarten teacher, Amy taught um, second grade, third grade, and special education and kindergarten and special education. So welcome, Amy. I appreciate you being here. And uh, I have a, my first question for you today is, Amy, how should race be addressed with young children in your well, first, I'd like to just say thank you for having me um, and hello to everybody. Um, you know, race being discussed in early education with children is often not happening because children are often told not to talk about race. Um, it's perceived as rude or racist to the, the adult who's advising them, but it's not. You know, children are not colorblind. Students uh, or actually children are as early as six months old when they start to see color. So acknowledging that my skin is brown is no more racist or rude than saying that Rob has on a blue shirt. Um, after the age of nine, children have a tendency to, rem to they, have, they have racial attitudes that remain the same. Um, but before age nine, we have a real chance to affect change in that area. Um, we can help children to develop positive attitudes about race and cultural identity. Um, you know, talking about color is only problematic when we start to assign a value to the color. So, for example, if someone was to say, oh, that's a really nice house, a white person might live there. Or, oh, you know, you're so well-spoken for a black boy. You're then assigning a value to the color, and that's when it becomes a problem for the children. Um, even myself, I have a three-year-old daughter, and the other day we were in our garden, and there was a zucchini that was starting to rot, and it was brown, and I caught myself starting to say, oh, it's brown and yucca, but I was assigning a value to the color brown, and then I had to think in that moment, well, what is that going to say to my daughter and her brown skin, that brown skin is yucca, and I don't want to do that, so what's more appropriate is for me to say, you know, zucchinis are supposed to be green and hard and this one's getting mushy and turning colors, so we don't want to eat it that way. And I eliminated the assignment of value to the color. Um, we can talk very clearly with young children and break things down for them. Um, if someone says, why is his skin so dark? It's perfectly acceptable to say, you know, 
people, all people have something in their skin called melanin and some people have more than others and that's what makes their skin darker. And for young children, it's like a science lesson and it's exciting and new and interesting to them. Um, you know, I had students in my own classroom say that another child was ugly because their skin was brown and that's the color of poop. And that's what happens in elementary and early childhood. They associate um, dirt and uh, poop and things that are brown with skin tone. Um, and so I had to redefine their thinking and help them to see that well, we like chocolate and brownies and cookies and teddy bears, and those are all brown, and brown is, in fact, a beautiful thing, um, and just try to reframe their thinking for that. And there are going to be times that children are going to surprise you with the question, and if you don't have a great answer for it or you don't know how to address it, it's perfectly acceptable to say, you know, that's a great question. I want to figure it out with you. Let's see if there's a book about that, or let's go to the library, and that's acceptable for young children. Thank you so much for that, and we'll get back to you. And that's extremely important as you know, as we're going through it. Some of these things that are identifiers, we don't realize the the effect that it can have um, with our children as we move as we move on. Um, so our next panelist is Dr. Sarah Medeiros, and Sarah is a graduate of Johnson and Wales University with a doctorate in educational leadership. She has ten years of experience working in special education, mostly in urban settings. Um, her research uh, interests include educational equity um, in the areas of race, disability, and special education. So welcome, um, Dr. Medeiros. And I have my question for you, uh, Dr. Medeiros, is how does racism present itself in special education? Um, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I think um, this is a really good opportunity to discuss this topic because I think that when equity is discussed, we often forget, I, I always say that like special education and disability rights are the like forgotten social justice. And like what Dr. Gannon had said, I feel like people have this hope, like everything will get better, everything will get better. And so often um, without taking action, it doesn't. Um, so something important that I think uh, needs to be recognized is that is the connectivity and the intersectionality between race and disability. Um, the idea of ability itself is racialized um, because disability in itself means a deviation from the norm. So um, if somebody perceives something to be different, that means it's a disability, right? So this goes back like hundreds and hundreds of years um, to the times of slavery. But um, back in like the 1900s, um, you know, there was scientific racism where, where they would try to um, prove the, the uh mental inferiority of black people and people of color by using like you know falsified data or um post-mortem brain studies where they didn't actually account for you know um age and all, all those different factors um that's all been debunked there's there's plenty of of research to prove that there's no there's no intelligent intelligence differences between races um race um, intelligence is not biological. Um, there's no, again, there's no differences between races. Um, but unfortunately, uh, fast forward to today, we have many inequities in special education that affect race. Um, and often we place this, um, you know, like we see a disability in special ed that we recognize there's an inequity, but it goes further than that because people, um, Black, Indigenous people of color, experience the inequities, you know, much worse than, than a white person. So I'll give you an example. Um, every year for the past 40 years, since the um, Individuals with Disabilities Act was passed, um, Congress reports the data on, um, you know, representation of kids in special education. And every single year for the past 40 years, black students have been overrepresented in special education. White students have never, ever, ever been overrepresented. So this is 40 years going on every single year. There's been very little improvement. Um, and when I say they're overrepresented in, in special education, I mean that they're overrepresented in disabilities that are considered, they're called high incidence disabilities. And um, these disabilities are not medicalized. So you can't, um, you can't perceive them, right? So if somebody has um, an orthopedic disability or you know, blindness, deafness, that's, you can perceive that as a medicalized disability. Those are called low incidence. 
Black, Indigenous, and people of color are overrepresented in high incidence disabilities. And these are diagnosed or labeled um, by school professionals. So people like me, a school psych, um, a counselor, we all get together on a team, we evaluate the student, and we are the ones who decide if a child has a disability. Um, the problem with this is that, as we know, um, the teaching force is overwhelmingly white, right? Um, more so even like school sites, it's even more white. Um, there's, there's less and less diversity in those kind of specialized areas. So um, again, like going back to what I said about disability being the absence of normal, if everyone who's um, evaluating a student is white, then their beliefs on what is normal is rooted in white culture, right? Um, and I know that sometimes it's hard to hear because um, you know people get defensive if I talk about this. This is my dissertation topic actually. And um, sometimes people get defensive when we talk about it and they're like, I would never diagnose a person with a disability. Um, but we need to understand it's often done unconsciously. It's an, it's an unconscious bias. Um, you know, if, if a child who's, um, uh, you know, a black, if there's a black girl who's perceived to be, um, you're perceiving to be a threat or whatever, that is your, your implicit bias towards black girls. And um, going back to what Kevin said, if you, if you just think it'll get better, it'll get better, it won't because we need to intentionally undo those biases that we have towards black indigenous people of color so that we can kind of um, undo it. So um, that's just kind of, there's like, I could talk for hours about the inequities in special education, but you know, special education is a, was, its intention, right, is to help to give um, people with disabilities a fair shot at life, right? But it's kind of turned into this thing where it's just a, yet another, um, another source of inequity. And, it, and again, I, going back to what I said before, black people are, are, are feeling it the most. Um, and it's just, it, it's kind of become like this other avenue that, um, you know, people of color are, are experiencing more um, inequities. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, it definitely resonates with me and some of my family members. Um, and you know, I can have stories upon stories of students that I've worked with as well. Um, so it's very, really important. So thank you for that. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely get back to you soon as well. Um, our next uh, panelist uh, today is uh, Missy Duart. Melissa Duart uh, holds a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish, um, Spanish and Master's in Arts in Teaching Spanish from UMass Dartmouth. Melissa taught Spanish at Hastings Middle School in Fairhaven for 11 years and spent the last seven years teaching Spanish and ESL um, and ESL at Fairhaven High School. Melissa has taught the ESL in New Bedford um, through um, the Massachusetts Migrant uh, Education Program and volunteered as an interpreter for medical for a medical mission in Honduras last summer. Um, this summer, Melissa will begin teaching Spanish, which I believe she already has, for our Upward Brown program at Bristol Community College. So welcome, Missy. Um, I appreciate you being here. And this is my question for you. Um, in order to earn a high school diploma, a student must pass um, a set of English, math, science, MCAS tests. Um, are these tests equitable for all students? Sorry, uh, thank you for having me. And they definitely are not equitable for all students. I deal predominantly with the ESL students. So they're usually newcomers to our school, usually newcomers to our country. And the school that I work in is predominantly white. So we have about 88% white students. These kids come to our high school, they're thrown into classes. We don't have the resources to handle volumes of you know speakers of other languages because it's never happened before we're a very low incident school so i'm the one esl teacher and i kind of got thrown into it in a sense i took the test and said okay sure i'll try it and oh really we have a couple of students great and then before you know it my program started to grow and grow and grow and then i was only teaching esl so you're you're in this school that has no resources and you're looking at these kids and they're oh what are we what are you here for well i want to graduate with a diploma well, you can't do that unless you pass these three tests. So how do we get these kids to pass tests when it's a test of kids who have been in the Massachusetts school system from K through 10, that's, that's where you take it to pass. And these kids are coming from rural Guatemala 
where you know they have very limited education they're you know trying to survive they're out working at 13 10 so it's very different for them they're trying to adjust to this new new life and schools just being thrown at them they're not getting uh things in their language nobody's really helping them so i look at this and say geez i, I gotta do something about this i need to help these students because they're not going to pass this test this test is biased without a doubt this test is you're testing english okay that's fine that should be in english but the math and science why does that have to be in english only why couldn't it be offered in the language of that's dominant of the student well, if you speak Spanish, you're lucky because math is, but forget it if you speak anything else. And that seems like it's not really fair. That's not equitable for those students. So they're already behind the eight ball with that. They're behind the eight ball with the language. We're trying to catch them up. We're trying to teach them basic math because they're not really learning those things. And they're constantly like feeling that they're behind. And their teachers, you know, not that teachers are bad, but they don't know how to deal with this because in a low incident school, you don't know what to do. So, you know, I'm trying to get in there and be the everything for them and, and contact the teachers and be in touch with them and give these kids extra work and, and try to figure out how we're going to get them to pass. And they just feel like they're being set up for failure. So, you know, we have to push to get rid of this test. It's, it doesn't seem fair. It's not only in my case, it would be Latinx students, but you know, this is unfair to, to black students. The, the lowest test scores are usually low income students, black and, and Latino. So I, I don't know how we can fix this problem, but we need some policy change. If we don't try to change these policies, this is systemic racism. This is an example of it. We're not going to get these kids to pass. One in three English language learners, they don't graduate on time and one in seven drop out mostly because they get into this pipeline of testing that they have to keep retaking the test. Sure, you can retake it as many times as you need to, but while you're doing that, you're missing sometimes 15 days of classes. In a year, you're already behind. So if we don't start to stand up for these students and say, hey, we need a change, we need to make this stop. Let's teach them something that they can use. Let's teach them something Instead of teaching to a test, let's teach them skills that make them employable, that allow them to go on to higher education. If you don't pass and you don't get that diploma, all you get is a certificate of attendance, which does you basically nothing. So you cannot go to Bristol Community College and take classes and go on to higher education until you pass this test. So until we can fix this system that is rigged, we're really leaving behind our most vulnerable students. Thank you so much, Missy, for that. And a lot of the students that I work with or I have worked with in the past as well have had issues um, passing their MCAS, and a lot of them are on the ESL spectrum. Um, uh, so that is something that we must take a further look on moving forward in our um, moving forward in this this battle that we are facing daily and that you see daily. Um, so we're going to move on to the next person. Thank you, Missy. We'll get back to you as well. Um, it was some follow-up questions that I wrote down, but um, our next panelist is going to be Serge Moniz. Um, Serge is a, um, a technical uh, teacher at Greater New Bedford Vocational High School, and he is, runs the diesel shop um, as an instructor there. Uh, Serge is a father of four, a former basketball coach, um, current basketball coach at, at Greater New Bedford, a former basketball coach at Bristol, um, and he is also the co he is the co-president of the um, Bedford uh, Greater New Bedford Education. Uh, educators union sorry um so serge uh my question for you and welcome is what is the value of career technical education and how can it benefit benefit minoritized um groups all right uh, well thanks for having me rob um let me start by saying i'm so uh happy and proud for you because as someone who's one of my closest friends getting to see how our conversations have changed and to just talk and we're really uh seeing you put things together to help make change it's it's incredible and then to listen to to you say nice things about me is a balance of the bromance you know <laughs> um, but as far as career and technical education it's so valuable because um as missy uh had just said what skills are we teaching our students we focus so much sometimes on um the, the areas where they're weak in but 
we're not really paying attention to the things that they're great at and how can we expose them to those opportunities where um, career and technical education is valuable to them. Now, I know we're in a forum with tons of college educators, but college isn't for everyone, right? And that's, and that's a reality. And we all know plumbers, electricians, carpenters who have phenomenal careers, who build great lives for themselves and their families. And so that pathway is something that has to share equal value because it's an education in itself, right? So if you're, if you're a master carpenter, you've spent just as much time in your trade as, as someone in, in the world of academia. So um, the, the work that you put in is no different. And so it, it needs that same value for these students because it gives them an opportunity to really um, build something special for themselves. And of course, um, every kid learns a little different as well. So having opportunities for different uh, career and technical areas where you might be in a uh, IT related program that really um, focuses and like some IT programs are so math heavy, right? And some students are incredibly good at math. So it suits them well. Um, maybe a student that would come into the diesel shop with me is someone who really likes to uh, see, touch, and, and feel what they're working on. And so it, it fits them well. Um, again, uh, vocational technical education is so valuable because it can create opportunities for our, uh, our young adults. you here. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and again, yeah, I think opportunities in special ed is major and something that we need to kind of, you know, we have our workforce development um, side here at Bristol as well. And we're looking to create programming and more and more training, especially so that way we can help specific groups that aren't going to go to college because we know that that's not realistic for everyone um, to go to college. But can we provide resources for our students who are looking to go into the technical field and then also looking to maybe increase our admissions policies at some of these technical schools because I know that there's been some barriers that really have prevented some of our uh, minority groups of um, gaining um, gaining attendance to those schools and um, why is that especially when it's needed um, so our next panelist is uh, uh, thank you Serge we'll get back to you so our next panelist is Heather uh, Pimentel uh, Heather is, is a graduate of Bristol Community College in 1989 and UMass Dartmouth in 91. Um, Heather graduated from Fitchburg State uh, University with in 2012 with a master's degree in educational leadership in management, earning an additional license certifying her as the assistant principal, uh, as an assistant principal and principal for grades seven through 12. Heather is a history teacher at Greater New Bedford Vocational Technical High School. That's such a long name. and. Um, <laughs> And has and most recently been elected as co-president with uh, Serge here as, as their first um, for their union. Um, so again, Heather, I have a question here for you, and um, welcome. And how does how do you enhance your curriculum, which is defined by state frameworks, to address the needs of diverse population of students? This is a good question. Um, I want to start by saying thanks for having me. I'm a little bit honored and humbled to be here with these amazing panelists that you have chosen. Um, I came here thinking I'm not an expert on anything, right? I've taught for a really long time. My craft has always been one that has evolved over 27 plus years. Um, so I really came with the mindset that I want to listen to what the other panelists have to say, learn, share, and apply. Um, and I think Kevin alluded to affecting change within my school. Um, and I, for me, that trend transcends the classroom, right? I, I want to affect the lives of my students, but I also want to bring these changes back to my faculty because there's always room for improvement. Um, and so as a history teacher, curriculum is obviously important. Um, but most important are the connections that we make with the individuals sitting in our classrooms of all colors, walks of life, backgrounds, et cetera. Um, and this can be really, really challenging when you teach at the high school level because a person like me, I teach supported classes, which would be students um, with disabilities and IEPs, but I also teach honors classes. Um, and in an honors class, the numbers are astronomically high because they have to be low for the kids 
who have greater needs. Um, so when you have a class of 28, 29, 30 kids, it's very, very difficult to make a connection to their individual story, which is very important. Um, and then you have the issue of the textbook that we use traditionally in, in all of our classes. They are predominantly written by white people, um, telling the white story of America um, for our white students. And so to diversify that curriculum, I'm gonna borrow a line um, from somebody, um, I can't quote the name of the, I, the name of the person isn't coming to me, but she said something like, teaching beyond the textbook is like DJing your own playlist, except what you're doing is DJing your own primary sources to fit the faces of the students in your classroom. Um, and it is absolutely unequivocal that we need to do better. We need more equity, we need more inclusion. So I'm a white woman, middle-aged, advantage just because of, of those things, right? Teaching brown, black, um, Hispanic students, I've got to be able to draw connections to them. So it's really pulling resources from a variety of places. Um, and right out of the gate, what I try to get them to do is challenge what they already know about history. So we do this immediate project. Um, it's from the DBQ project, which is available online. Anybody can look it up. Um, and the question that I ask my 14 year old freshman students is how revolutionary was the Revolutionary War with the idea that the war was meant to bring about great change that would affect all of the people living in the 13 colonies at the time. So we look at a whole host of different documents. Um, we look at a document, it's a, it's a piece of artwork. Um, slaves pulling down the statue of the king while the white men who owned them stood in the background and watched and try to get them to draw on those images um, all the way up through the 19th amendment um, in 1920 giving women the right to vote if it was a revolution and all it did was take power from wealthy white men in england and transfer power to wealthy white men in america was it truly revolutionary so it's really about getting them to dig deep and to find themselves in the story and be able to make a connection to their life today um, because the struggle is real it's still ever present everything everybody has said here today um, speaks to that so uh, finding stories of the minorities in history and getting kids to delve in, investigate, examine, question, and want to know more because that story somehow speaks to them. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for that. And that's extremely important. Um, you don't even realize it. And sometimes I think when we're talking about advantage and privilege, we don't recognize that what we are taught kind of puts us into this um, this mode or this thought process that we think that, you know, what we are taught is all that that's there. And we don't have that other side of the black history that should be in taught in, in school. We have one more, um, another project that comes to mind really quickly. The kids investigate how free, free black men were in Northern states prior to the civil war. And we use the word black in the question. And I have white kids who say, Mrs. Pimentel, you can't say that. And, I'm, and this goes back um, to what the first, I forget her name, I'm sorry, the, the kindergarten teacher said the, um, about the color brown. And I said, why can't we say a person is brown or black? That's not offensive, it's fact. And it celebrates the individuality in all of us. So just creating spaces for those conversations beyond the textbook, which I don't really even use very often because it's in a textbook, a snippet about black people, a snippet about women, a snippet about immigrants, et cetera. Thank you so much for that. That's Thank so you. So um, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Shanna Howell. Uh, Dr. Shanna Howell has uh, earned her bachelor's of science in sociology at the University of West Georgia. Her master's in science and adult learning and organizational performance from Drake University and her doctor of philosophy and education leadership and policy studies for community uh, uh, college leadership, for our community college leadership program from Iowa State University. Um, following positions at the University of West Georgia, 
Drake University in Des Moines, um, uh, Des Moines, Iowa area community college. Jenna joined Grandview University, where she left Kevin several years ago in 2018 um, as the institutional director um, for a student success. Shannon was named the Dean of Bristol Community College New Bedford campus this past August uh, in 2019. So welcome Dr. Howell. I appreciate you being here with us today and spending time with us. Um, Dr. Howell, how could you talk about your experience in higher education um, and about the challenges you may have had to overcome while furthering your education as a black woman? First of all, Rob, thank you for having me and um, welcome to everyone. It's great to see so many people here today. Um, first of all, I just wanna just say thank you for, for taking the time out this evening to talk about this subject. I think, you know, for a lot of us, uh, this is sometimes it gets a little touchy and if we get a little bit uncomfortable when we talk about these subjects. So um, I just wanna thank all of you for being here. My educational career um, in undergrad, I was a first generation college student. My mother passed away when I was 13 years old and my, my sister raised me. Um, and so when I went off to college, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, I don't know, somehow we have in our heads that once a person turns 18, they're ready to, to go to college and to be able to make decisions. And uh, I was on academic probation my freshman year in college because I had no idea really what I was doing. And eventually it took me seven years just to get my bachelor's degree. And I say all that to say that a lot of times, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm an advocate for community college. I think I would have benefited if I had attended community college first, smaller classrooms. My first sociology class had um, 200 students in it. Um, and that ended up being my major. Uh, so it's interesting because I ended up being a C in that class and that ended up being my major, but I just was not prepared for the environment that I was stepping into. Um, the college I attended was a predominantly white state institution that didn't have many people that looked like me, um, though there were a lot of black student unions, a lot of student, um, programming. Um, I didn't see that in my classroom. I didn't see that a lot of times with my peers, a lot of times with my professors, grad assistants, or anything like that. So I think in some ways that kind of hindered me because I really didn't have anyone that I felt comfortable going to and talking to about what I was struggling with um, during my undergraduate career. I want to skip over and go to my doctoral program. I was in a program of uh, 13 individuals who were all professionals in higher education, and I was the only person that looked like me. Um, and so at many times, not because as a practitioner, I knew the work, um, but I felt like I wasn't intelligent. We had philosophers and individ individuals with um, all these great degrees who spoke very well. I was, very, I was not very confident in the way that I spoke, but I knew I was a hard worker. Um, and so out of the 13, uh, I ended up being the second person to defend. So I actually was the second person to, to finish our program. Um, and I say that to say that sometimes, and I tell people all the time, the way I got through my program was a white male in my program. He was the first one to finish. And I say that because when we talk about allies, sometimes I think we forget that we're all allies and we all need to support students and support one another. Um, but I got through my program when a white, this, um, my white friend, Michael, who would literally contact me once a week and say, Shanna, how are you doing? What's going on? What can I do to support you? Where are you at? Have you done this? Have you done that? And so I just wanna say that to all of you that just because you're white doesn't mean that you can't still advocate and be a, an ally, ally um, for more of, of our students of color. Um, a lot of times I think people say, well, what can I do? I don't know what to do. I'm not black, I don't know what to say. Um, it's an encouraging word. It's a you know follow up on the conversation that you might've had with a student. It's a just telling the student, you know what? You did a really good job, I'm so proud of you. Um, if a student pulled a grade from a D to a C, tell them that's great, that's awesome. Next time we're going to try to get we're going to try to get a, a B or an A. So I think um, when I think about my college um, experience and um, sometimes feeling alone, um, I think about our the students that I work with every day, and I and I wonder, you know, how what are they thinking? How are they feeling that they don't see a lot of people that look like them? That's why people I tell people all the time I didn't really like school. I was pretty decent at it, but I, I, I pursued a, a, a doctorate because I wanted to put myself in a position where students could see somebody that looked like them. 
that I can share my story with them about how I struggled in college. And I was on academic probation. So I tell her I went from probation to a PhD. So if I can do it, a person who probably shouldn't, I don't even know if I should have gone to college sometimes when I think about it, but here I am now. So if I can do it, that they can do it and that they're, that I'm there to support them. So I just want to encourage all of you to be that person for those um, that you work with. Even if you don't work with students every day, you, there's still things you can do. If you see a student in the hallway, speak to them and say, hey, how you doing? Whatever it may be, just give your, make those opportunities available. Don't expect those opportunities to come to you. You have to make those opportunities. Well, thank you so much for that. It's extremely powerful and uh, relationship building, and we'll have some questions on relationship building. It's extremely, it's extremely powerful, and I think we don't realize that where we are in our touch points of how just having a simple conversation or encourage, or just a little sense of encouragement can go a long way with the student. Because a lot of students, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be a student of color, but a lot of students lack confidence um, when they're going to school. Um, but just imagine if, you know, we're there, uh, wherever we are, elementary to middle school, to high school, to college, and if you can encourage someone. And I know that I have a fifth grade teacher and I have someone freshman year in college that I remember to this day that really um, influenced, helped me get through when I felt like I was pretty much done with school. So thank you for that, it's extremely powerful. So our last panelist, before we get into our, our Q and A's with everything is Dr. Ingen Atase. And thank you, uh, Professor and Dr. Atase from being here. Um, he's a good friend of mine as well. Um, professor Atase is a, um, is a professor in education at Bristol Community College and program coordinator for elementary ed. Um, he holds a PhD in, so, uh, in Social and Philosophical Foundations of Education from the Department of Education. Um, he's a culture and, uh, culture and Society at the from the University of, of Utah. Apologize there. Apart from teaching philosophy and humanities and education courses as a full-time faculty member, Engen has an interdisciplinary uh, research agenda invested in mapping neoliberal um, educational um, discourses and subjectivity. So uh, welcome, Dr. Atase. I, I appreciate you being here. Um, my question for you is, how can faculty in universities and colleges begin to cultivate um, equity pedagogy in the classroom? In the classroom. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll start with an example, which I think speaks to something that we can all do in our classrooms in college. In higher education, um, there's this perception that, you know, higher ed is more of a, a grown-up place, you know, where <laughs> the social emotional piece is left behind the door. You know, the moment you step into the classroom, you just have to focus on the objective, the, the sterilized knowledge, right? Knowledge comes first and the person comes maybe never. It never comes. Uh, maybe we can start by changing that. And I, I want to give you the example of asking all of you to refer to me as Engin as opposed to Dr. Atasai. <laughs> it sounds weird, man. Uh, but yeah, I have, a, I have a PhD. I'm a doctor. Uh, but I try not to put that in front of my students' faces. You know, hey, look, I'm the professor. Here's my PhD. Call me Dr. Atasai. And I understand I have a lot of privilege uh, walking in there and making fun of my own name and my titles. It's not always so easy for folks who are not as privileged as I am. I come from Turkey. I have this ambivalent identity, so I can easily make fun of my identity. So what I'm trying to get to is the idea that in the classroom, perhaps we can start off with trying to build those relationships by being a little more open and vulnerable and not really getting co-opted by this, this academic uh, environment that often asks us to become the so-called expert, the, the highly uh, uh, untouchable uh, professor. And I know a lot of my colleagues are, are not stepping into those shoes. They're very approachable, very accessible. And I think that's the best strategy to, to begin to create an equitable pedagogical approach to knowledge. We have to prioritize the, the student first. Uh, we have to empower their identities, their experiences, their funds of knowledge before we move on to the academic knowledge that we want to teach them. So I would argue that the first step is the relational approach, the, the idea that we have to place the person first. 
And I do that by exemplifying myself as this person first, and then secondary is the professor, right? I'm first Engin, and then I am the professor. That opens up a lot of good conversations. It opens up a completely whole different venue for students to begin to relate to who I am. Uh, I become buddies and I don't like, you know, go out and have drinks with them, but it's, it's just a friendlier and more relaxing and comforting environment for them to be in. And when you consider a lot of our students who are maybe first time college students, they're the first uh, member of their family who goes to college, the, the, the institution, I read the institution is a very uh, scary place. It could be intimidating. So to find that relational uh, person that they could really hold on to, to give them a, a fair chance to, to begin to acquire knowledge. And I would, I would echo a lot of the other strategies that the panelists have emphasized, the idea that you know, the content has to be meaningful, it, it cannot be whitewashed, uh, you can definitely draw on, again, students' funds of knowledge, their experiences, uh, make relevance to contemporary current issues that they're really passionate about, uh, bring in local media, bring in local issues. Uh, those things will give students the, the chance to hold on to the other sort of knowledge that you want to scaffold, scaffold and build on. Uh, so don't present knowledge as this you know, highly objective, sterilized thing that you put into their head. Um, have them claim it, have students claim their knowledge, make sure that they're passionate about what they're investigating. And that only happens when you create opportunities for them to bring in their own funds of knowledge and experiences. So I, I'm kind of echoing a lot of the panelists. Um, I think I would also add, you know, accessibility, you know, the, the technicality of, you know, having things that are accessible, like open educational resources, creating materials that are uh, sensitive to diversity and inclusion. Uh, one strategy, quick strategy that I have in my syllabus, for instance, when I start the, the classes, the semesters, I usually include my preferred pronoun, you know, as a way to give students the opportunity to see that this is a safe space for all identities. So I use my, my pronouns and I tell them these are my pronouns. And if you have preferred names or pronouns, please let me know and I will honor it. I will definitely use those pieces of, of, of identification. Uh, so little strategies, it doesn't have to be a grand strategy, but looking at our assessment, looking at our uh, resources and what sort of access we provide to students goes a long way. Uh, and I'll finish up with another little piece of example, uh, assignments, you know, assignments should not necessarily be too rigid. I try to give many different options of assignments because not everybody learns the same way. And that, that, that is true with a lot of our students who come from very different backgrounds. So I try to give them as many options as I can so that they can find the most meaningful assignment that will allow them to express their knowledge. So in that sense, I, I am more of a flexible pedagogue as opposed to a rigid one. Um, maybe you can even refer to some Taoist teaching about how we should all be um, more fluid and like water rather than rigid because um, rigidity is often coupled with a lot of uh, institutional frameworks of white privilege and other sorts of privilege that have worked well for students who come from uh, highly affluent backgrounds and I don't want to take up, take up too much time but I can just keep on going and going uh, but I'll, I'll leave room for dialogue later on. We'll talk more. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. That's, um, isn't this panel great? This is like so powerful and hearing it from different perspectives. Um, so I appreciate you, um, Engen, uh, for that. Um, you know, we, before we get into the Q&A with everyone, I have like this random question for any of the panelists. And maybe, Kevin, if you would want to start here. But how, you know, so a lot of the teachers may not have an understanding where they're, what level you are. Um, how can teachers, un, you know, unconscious bias unknowingly uh, contribute to racism in our schools? And then maybe a lot of us can maybe kind of contribute from our areas of where, where we stand and whatever level we are. So, yeah, I saw that the question in the chat, too, about, you know, there are a lot of ways uh, in which we as educators can perpetuate racism and the effects of racism. Um, and I'll, there are two that, that I'll, I'll point out sort of very specifically. One, 
is you look at all the research, and, and I'm most familiar with the higher ed research, but I think it echoes what we see on K to 12, is who do teachers call upon the most in class discussions or in interactive collaborative activities? Uh, males more than females and whites more than any other students of color. Uh, and this is true across various demographic groups of instructors, not just white instructors. And so to me, this is something that's kind of baked into the cake, right? The socialization process that we have about who gets to talk and who gets to talk first and who participates and all of those things. So being very mindful, very intentional when I'm working with students about, you know, who is getting a voice right now? Uh, and is there a pattern there? And if there is, what do I need to do about that? So my own practice in terms of acknowledging students uh, inviting students into a conversation and making sure that a discussion doesn't just acknowledge who's the first to raise their hand or jump in or interrupt because men like me tend to interrupt very more than any other group as well. Uh, and then seeing if we can, you know, create space for all of our student voices, not just the ones that are first and loudest. And then the second thing is we need to look at the course materials that we use. So I come out of the discipline of history, uh, and as, as uh, other as Missy pointed out, I think that you know it, it is a whitewashed curriculum. Who writes the books? Who writes the textbooks? Who writes the curricular standards that are used? Uh, who designs the courses on the higher ed level? And so if I tell my students, who you know for Iowa standards in particular are a pretty diverse group. Um, that all of them can be historians, that I want all of them to engage in the scholarly conversation, to be knowledge producers, to, to take part in these scholarly conversations about the discipline of history. And then every bit of their course materials are authored by people who do not look like them, who do not come from similar experiences them, then what I'm telling them I want them to do and what I'm showing them are completely different things. And so representation does matter. And you know, so, so some critics might say, oh, that's just a checklist. It's you know, affirmative action for textbooks or whatever. But I would argue, we know there are teaching and learning benefits. We know there are direct pedagogical benefits for students seeing themselves in the material, some personal connection, some personal relevance. And in a lot of, uh, a lot of disciplines where students have some anxiety, history is one of them, mathematics is another, having that personal connection right away can really work wonders. It's one of those seemingly minor choices that actually has major consequences. But if we don't think about that, then we do perpetuate racism because structures of inequality that are present now, structures of inequality will always reproduce themselves. That's the default action. What stops that process is an active intervention. And so I see my job is to actively intervene in that process of reproduction. And even something seemingly routine and, and boring as a choice of textbooks or course materials, or who I call on first in class, or who, who, you know, who I listen to in class first, those choices matter a lot because that's an intervention. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to? Uh... I can speak on that a little bit. Um, so I think when we're when we're talking about um, implicit bias, I think it's important to um, to look at like the numbers in education, right? So um, the the demographics of our population is changing. Um, in the last twenty years, what the white student population has declined. I think it's like fifteen percent, um, and diversity is increasing. But over the last 20 years, we haven't seen um, really much of a change in the teaching force for, as far as diversity, which is a whole other conversation we could have. Um, but you know, when this racial rep when there's this cultural mismatch, um, this this has an impact. And um, the problem is, is that so often teachers um, they like to say that they're colorblind, which we've already touched upon of how it's harmful. Um, so if you're not intentionally changing something. Um, you're perpetuating it. You're, you're, it's going to keep happening. So I've, I've, um, I include this in my, my literature review for my dissertation, but there's a lot of ways that that cultural mismatch impacts um, teachers. And it's, it's, um, there's so many specific ways. So for example, um, teacher perceptions of students. Um, teachers will, will um, they, they've done studies on, you know, they just give kind of like a little like a picture and a little blurb of a student. And they'll say, where do you think this child will be in 20 years? And the way that white teachers perceive black students, um, indigenous students, students of color, they'll perceive them to have a lower educational attainment, a lower, um, you know, just career attainment in general. Um, and we know that, you know, the way we perceive our students and what we believe our students to be, it's, it often happens, you know. Our, our perceptions of students has a huge impact on them. 
Um, also, it Im impacts um, our expectations. So, like, so you know, a lot of times, um, I, I'm actually reading the book Push Out by um, Dr. Morrison, um, and it's about um, the criminalization of Black girls, and it talks a lot about how the expectations for Black girls and Black children in general is so low. And there's been studies on this as well to show that um, you know, teacher white teachers will often have such high expectations for their um, uh, white students, but when it comes to the black students, they'll kind of accept the bare minimum. So if they don't feel like doing something that day, they kind of won't, they kind of won't go there with that student, but they'll push their white students um, a little bit more. And, um, you know, also like the interaction. So like uh, the relationship building, like we talked about earlier, um, that, that, that cultural difference also has an impact. And going back to what I originally spoke about, I think to me, the biggest, the biggest implicit bias in education that's huge is disability. Um, even though I'm, this is not for me to say, I'm not saying that there's no, um, there's no black students with disabilities, there's no people of color with disabilities. The way that we, um, there's no denying the numbers, there's no denying the research, there's a huge, huge problem in the overrepresentation of students of color in, in special ed. And that is due to, to implicit bias. The, um, the, the way that we view our students, um, you know, the, the way that, that we're judging them, the way that we're evaluating them is all rooted in our white culture and white, um, white ideologies. And that has a huge impact on, um, on when we evaluate and refer students to special ed. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to chime in? I have another question for the panel if we don't. All right, cool. So here's a question before we open up to everyone. Um, so what have we, you know, you've been doing, so this is a lot of questions I get a lot um, from, um, from different professors at the college and, and also secondary educate, um, educators. Um, what have you been doing uh, through these challenging times to better prepare for difficult conversations that may occur um, about the death of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter movement, police brutality, et cetera, in your classroom and areas? And anybody of the panel can start with that. I'll start if that's okay. Um, you know, so I teach in early education with kindergartners. Um, I think that we as adults, not only teachers, are often uncomfortable talking with that age group about race. Um, but I feel like that's a privilege that we can no longer afford to have. And there are going to be questions and we have to be prepared to how we want to talk about that. Um, just really briefly, I'll talk a little bit about where kids in early, um, in early education fall developmentally and how they can be part of those conversations. So even as early as kindergartners, well, I'll go back to preschoolers. Um, you know, preschoolers notice differences. They notice differences in hair texture and skin tone. And, you know, they may not have a full understanding of the concept of race, but they understand that there are children who are different. Um, preschoolers want to know more information. They want to understand why things are the way that they are. Um, and their thinking is really limited. And unfortunately, as early as four years old, kids can start to prefer one race over another one. Um, they're also really um, likely to, or you know, the, the likelihood of them believing stereotypes and um, falling into pre-prejudices are developmentally appropriate because their thinking is so limited. Um, so really making sure that the activities that you're doing within the classrooms, you playing games that come from other cultures, um, doing art projects that include other races, allowing for their free play time to include other cultures of the books that you read. That's really appropriate for them because, you know, I always, I strongly believe that early education is the foundation for a person's life. Um, and oftentimes people don't think about early education as time to really have these conversations. Um, but kids are home and they're hearing their parents, they're hearing what's happening on the news and they may have questions and it's okay, you know, to talk about it. Even for kindergartners, kindergartners have questions about physical differences and they, but they can understand really basic explanations. And by the age of six, they understand what's fair and what's not fair. So that really lends itself well into conversations about race and racial injustice. Um, what's most exciting, I think, is that by seven and eight, children um, have developed empathy and they're better able to empathize. And they also want to know more about what's going on in the world, right? 
So that's the perfect time to start having conversations and have uh, giving them accurate information. Um, because the earlier that we talk to these children, it increases the likelihood that they're going to grow into adults who are affirming and accepting of different cultures and differences. Um, so, you know, to be more specific to your question about, you know, how would we address things that have gone on in the media, particularly George Floyd, um, you have to consider where these students are developmentally and play on that, but it's don't avoid it. You know, there's questions that are going to be had. There's ways to incorporate um, different things in the classroom um, as far as, you know, different read alouds, as I mentioned, different games, different activities. Um, and just showing them by example that other races that or other people that don't look like you other cultures They're not negative. Let's celebrate that. Let's talk about it Let's you know have show and tell and you can show me a dance that your family does or let's talk about the different meals and just really being more diverse and inclusive of different cultures and not allowing them to get to a point as I said earlier, you know by age nine they often have already decided how they feel about our race. And so it's really our job as early educators to intervene and to create positive associations with race and culture um, and to not be scared to have those conversations. Oftentimes adults don't wanna talk about that with young kids because they think it's such an adult issue. But if you break it down and think about where these kids fall developmentally, it's, it's more than appropriate. Can I speak yeah, go ahead. a little bit? So I would add to what you just said, it's not just uh, adults not wanting to have those conversations with small children, it's adults not wanting to have those conversations, period. Um, and so for me, it's really been a summer of reading, listening, and trying to learn. Um, I don't know what it was like to grow up black or brown in America. I can't pretend to know that. and you know, engaging in conversations in my own family, my parents, my husband's parents, who come with their own set of biases and trying to get them to see beyond their color blindness. And I'm like, faced with the idea of going back to school and having students 14 year olds coming in hearing what the things that their parents have said right having these biases brought into the room and at the same time being able to open up conversations that are healthy and not combative um, where students are able to listen and share and learn um, super challenging um, I don't know how we'll be doing it remotely um, but I look forward to the challenge I think it's a worthy one I think um, we have to begin to have these difficult conversations, even if people are uncomfortable. Absolutely. I have one strategy, Rob, if you don't mind, real quickly. I think a good approach that I'm hoping to implement moving on is to create opportunities for collaborative dialogue, as opposed to keeping discussions just in the classroom. My goal next semester, even though it will be virtual, is to try to find collaborative events between different centers, different programs, or perhaps with other faculty, where as a, as a group, as a big community, we can engage these discussions as opposed to just keeping it in the classroom or just as an exchange between me and the student. I think if, if we could create a dialogue, a broad dialogue with a lot of community members, there's more value and more impact in that. So that, that is one suggestion and one strategy that I'm hoping to try to implement moving on. Well, thank you so much for that as well. Um, so we'll, let's get to the um, open questions for our Q&A for our audience. Um, and we can kind of do that for, um, for the remainder here. Uh, I'm seeing our chat room is, is really exciting. There's a lot of good information there. Um, and I see that, you know, uh, one thing that we we're talking about uh, in the chat room is COVID and uh, and how you know and what's happening now. So you have the racial divide that's that's going on, and you also have COVID and not of online and remote learning. Um, so I see some questions there, um, and I didn't know if uh, somebody wanted to jump in and ask a question, or I can kind of just read from the chat as well. There's a lot here, so I'm trying to balance everything. So 
just to kind of give a heads up that I'll eventually hopefully be at the right place marker. I have a question. Yep, sure, go ahead. Hi, I'm a first grade teacher in New Bedford Public Schools and I teach in a very diverse uh, school. I teach first grade and just like the kindergarten teacher that I believe teaches a Randolph, I do believe that children should know about history and it should be told in a way that is truthful and not sugarcoated for them. But I do get, get criticized a lot with my uh, teachers, my peers, because they think that sometimes I tell children things that happen in history that are too cool for first graders to know. Now, 90% of my kids are Hispanic and African American, and my minority happens to be white. I feel that I need to say that to my students because they come from homes where they talk about this. So when we talk about Martin Luther King, when we talk about civil rights, when we talk about all the African American people in history, I tell them the way I learned. I joined when I was in high school, got history classes. So I have a lot of knowledge on that, but my teachers don't feel comfortable having their classes coming into my class when I teach that topic. Do you think I'm out of line when I do that? I think that it's appropriate to want to share the truth with children. And I think, I don't know what your um, message exactly sounds like. And so I, I will, criticize whether or not you're out of line. I would just offer that in cases like that, when you're talking about uh, such important topics, filter it through the lens of the, your audience, right? So if you're teaching first graders, it's okay to look at the bigger picture of what happened, but maybe some of the details, they they can get it later when they're in you know, middle high school. But if we wanna just teach them about the injustices that have happened, um, it's okay to talk about it and also talk about the progress that is made so that children aren't left fearful because I think first graders oftentimes they hear that if they're hearing that you know black students were treated poorly by um, you know white people and they had to sit in the back of the bus and you know whatever it is that you want to address with them it's okay but for them they don't always know how to process it fully so make it a a go for a full circle and say, well, you know, look now, I often talk to my students about Ruby Bridges and and about what school looked like a long time ago. And I said, you know, a long time ago, I wouldn't be able to be your teacher and you two wouldn't be able to sit next to each other and be friends, but look at the progress that we've made and just it, it make it encouraging for them. Um, and also just pointing out that there are people in the world that, you know, do and do not look like them that are working really hard to make sure that we don't go back to those ways and that we're going to continue to go forward um, and just just think about your audience but I don't think you're wrong for wanting to do it and I don't know how you approach it but just always filter it through the lens of who you're talking to. Thank you. Yeah you're welcome. Um, I can add to that too. Um, I think that it's awesome that teachers are having these conversations and you know speaking the truth to their students whether it has to be filtered through a lens of early childhood or whether they're in high school or college but I think that something that often gets forgotten is um, the children who are in the mostly white schools, those are the ones who absolutely need to hear the truth of what of things that happen. Um, I went to Dartmouth High and I didn't learn any of black history. I feel like I, I didn't learn any black history. Maybe I did a little bit, but I feel like I didn't learn the truth of like the horrible things that happened. I remember when I was in college and I learned about Emmett Till and I learned about all these things, I was so mad that I that it took until I was an adult to learn about these awful things that white people did. We got a very like sugar coated, spoon fed uh, version of it. We need we need to be talking to our white students about this is this horrible thing that happened, um, and this is what white people have been doing for all these years, and it's up to you as white people to undo it because without white people being allies to black people, indigenous people, people of color, nothing is gonna change. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else wanna chime in on that question? I can chime in a little bit. Yep. So I also teach at a predominantly white high school and this year I've been asked to start a social justice course that's gonna be for incoming freshmen. So I'm happy to say that we're making some progress so that we can get this stuff out there, have these difficult conversations with kids so that they in turn can learn to be allies. They come in with this set of ideas, they don't even really know what they're saying. They don't understand 
what's happening in this world around them. So I want to be able to learn a lot this summer. I'm also doing a lot of reading, you know, watching documentaries, participating in forums and trying to educate myself so that I can turn this over to the kids and let them have these conversations, let them ask questions and, and have that open dialogue, which it's going to be tough. I'm sure we're going to have some difficult days, but I think they're going to get a lot out of it. And I think that's going to be that agent of change. Let's move this forward. Let's, let's start breaking down these walls. Can I also, sorry, may I add something? Is that okay? Yeah, sorry. Um, I also was just thinking about, we've been talking about actionable steps and, um, and ways that we can go forward. And I've also mentioned in my talking that, you know, it's really important to intervene early to talk to kids young. Um, I told you seven and eight is that really magical number where they can empathize and they're interested in the world. And so um, one of the things that I did this summer is I did reach out to the superintendent of Randolph and my principal at the time um, and asked if I could start a multicultural club, which is traditionally happens in middle and high school, but for it to happen in elementary school gives children that opportunity to have these conversations earlier when I personally feel it's more important. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure how many other teachers here are in elementary, but I think it's often thought of as something that's for older children, but the superintendent was really excited about it. I'm really excited about it. I'm not sure what it's going to look like with COVID, but I'm going to proceed anyway. And if it has to be via Zoom and we have to figure it out that way. Um, but I just feel like it's thought of for older kids, but it's really appropriate and probably more important now than ever to do it in the elementary schools. Absolutely. I think having these conversations as early as possible, it, it will help. Um, but also what, you know, Missy, Amy, and um, Sarah spoke about is you don't have to be an expert either. I'm not, I, I'm the director of multicultural affairs and I'm not an expert in all this. There's so much information that's out there. So you try to learn as much as you can and be able to influence your little circle of change and, and, and by doing that and learning on a daily basis. I think sometimes a lot of people that may be in here either want to create change or they are part of that circle of change or maybe their role is everyone's looking at, you know, if Amy, I'm not sure if your school, if you're one of how many black teachers, they may look at, well, Amy has to be the one to lead this too, see? So, and if that's happening, then why is that? Or if they're a special ed, um, you know, educator, that means, you know, that person must leave. No, it's, it's all of our jobs and how we can influence in our little areas. And we don't have to be an expert in this. So um, I really appreciate those, um, those comments. One question. Can I just jump in real yeah, quick, yeah, yeah, Rob? Ahead. Yes, because what you just said resonated with something that Sarah just said that, that really kind of hit me too, is that, you know, for those of us who are white and, you know, chances are, you know, it's white people who are the majority of the faculty and staff at your institution, you know, this is our work to do. Um, you know, we can't ask our, our black and brown colleagues to be doing that sort of extra emotional labor of being the diversity people, right? And, you know, and even if we need to be working on the spaces that we're in and the, the self-work and education that's necessary, it's also not our black and brown colleagues' job to educate us, right? Like, we have to be willing to do that work and not take the off ramps, the easy off ramps where the conversation gets a little difficult. And one of the other things that, you know, sometimes happens in these spaces that I've seen is that, you know, it'll be a, it'll be a diverse group of folks around the table talking about, you know, issues of equity and inclusion and oftentimes student success gets in there. Uh, and, you know, we, we talk about an incident that might have happened to a student, to a black student, for example. And then there's a white colleague who wants to talk about like, oh, well, this happened to me. And so I feel excluded when this, you know, and one of the things that we do, and I say we as in white people, oftentimes subconsciously, without meaning to, is we make it about us and we take other experiences and try to center them in ourselves. And there are times, and I have learned this the hard way, believe me, that we just need to listen and that we need to, to get ourselves out of our own ways uh, to do this work and, you know, and to really, you know, to be willing to show up. But showing up doesn't always mean out in front banging the drum either. Uh, and, and that's a hard, you know, and again, I don't do this well all the time at all. Uh, I have learned this the hard way. I have done some things very unskillfully. But I think we all, all of us who are white, especially a majority white faculty and staff, we really need to take a hard look at the labor and oftentimes the extra labor, the emotional, the uncompensated labor that we're asking our colleagues of color to do, um, because that's a really significant equity issue. Uh, and it's less bandwidth that our colleagues will have left for their students. 
No, absolutely. And, and Dr. Uh, Charlotte Butts from Taunton Public Schools also says exhausting having to talk to white colleagues all the time about race. Um, and that having an understanding that as educators, and one thing I've always looked at is you're teaching, you know, the student, not just the subject. And I having an understanding that when your student is, is there or your colleagues are there, that we're supposed to be the, the ones who are co consistently educating ourselves in order to learn more about what we're doing. And I think sometimes we just don't take that responsibility. And it's easy to push that on our black colleagues or our colleagues of different race or ethnicities or identities, special ed, wherever it may be. And then we're just like, well, they handle it and not really take that responsibility to get to better, to know our students a little bit better. So that's extremely powerful what you're saying. And trust me, I, I hear you, um, Dr. Butts, as, as, as that is something that many um, uh, black educators feel sometimes they're kind of cornered in, in doing that. And again, Kevin, I think you saying that and being stand up is, again, these are difficult conversations to have, um, but it's, it's absolutely powerful um, to do so. And, and we definitely appreciate the help. <laughs> um, so there was a comment here with, with Julie, and I kind of wanted to talk about this because I think some of our panelists can, uh, and Julie is the director of um, disability services here at, at Bristol Community College. And I'm not sure if she's still in, but she did make a mention here. Uh, many students in special education are still labeled as behavioral problems, as opposed to being diagnosed um, properly with true learning and other disability issues. Um, these labels are loaded with cultural bias. So how, how do we work with this and, and, and dispel this? Um, I can answer that if you want. Um, so she, she's right. Um, a lot of times, um, there's actually a lot of research on, uh, so black students are four times more likely to be labeled with a behavioral disability than white students. Um, Native American students, it's like five or six times more likely. Um, the numbers are huge. Um, and a lot of times this happens because um, ADHD um, and those kind of executive functioning disorders are actually like referred to as like um like kind of like a higher class disability if that makes any sense it's, but it, it is true white students are more likely to have that diagnosis and you know kind of be treated with a little bit more because you know if you see an adhd diagnosis you're like okay um i have to be patient i have to put in these accommodations when it's a behavioral disability oftentimes it doesn't get the, the kind of um, you know love and compassion, and often it's mis it's it's obviously mislabeled because there's such an overrepresentation. But oftentimes it's mislabeled. Um, so the the problem the problem is in the way you fix it. And again, this is not something that can be fixed like overnight. This is like work that everybody has to do, and not just the special ed population, not just the special ed staff, but everybody. Um, it's really working together to. Um, Find, find ways to, to truly, um, you know, educate the staff on what disability truly is. Um, my dissertation was on this, this exact topic, and I interviewed teachers, multidisciplinary teams who were um, labeling students with disabilities, and I went around the table, didn't even talk about race. I just said, what are the things that, that you know, um, contribute to you positively um, identifying a student with a, with a disability? whether it's um, intellectual, behavioral, or a learning disability. And almost all of the people who answered, it was always due to factors that had nothing to do with disability, right? A disability is, is, a dis, is, a dis, is disabled learning, right? Um, same thing with behavioral. There's, there's an emotional piece to that. Um, intellectual, there's a cognitive um, piece to that. As we talked about before, IQ testing, and I wrote it in the chat, I don't know, I don't know if I said it before, but Standardized testing, IQ testing is based on eugenics. So we can't take those standardized testing as Bible, right? We can't, we can't take that to mean the end all be all because we know that our black students are gonna score lower on that because it's a, it's a, it's a test that's based on racism and eugenics. So it's really finding a, a, a way to balance and not, and not so much because people often want to give a number, right? They wanna be like, okay, this is the cutoff number and this means he has a disability. We can't do that. We have to all take our areas of expertise, the school psych, the special ed teacher. We need to all educate ourselves on what disability truly is because disability is not a lack of opportunity for instruction. Disability is not poverty. Disability is not an, uh, an ELL issue. 
disability is, a, is disabled learning. So if the child is behind, I hear so often with, and this is not to demonize general education teachers. I think that you guys are phenomenal and you guys do so much, but they, they're, they come in with this assumption that a disability is, okay, that student's behind, he needs to go on an IEP. The IEP is not going to solve the, the fact that he did not have the opportunity in whatever, in whatever area. There's so many different factors, but again, this, this is a, such a huge, um, it's a huge problem that has not been addressed. Uh, it, it, no, no mandate in the IDA or, or our federal government has ever, you know, found a way to, to deal with this issue. And, and I think this is why I believe that the IDA needs to be reauthorized again to include more of a, um, a problem solving approach that's not just um, using numerical values because right now the only consequence is like they, they you know, it, it's all based on numbers. This is not a numbers issue. This is, this is such a uh, structural issue that we really, really need to dive deep into. I'm sorry, I'm talking so much, but you can tell I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> Absolutely, and that, your passion is the reason why I asked you and the panelists to be here because I, I know all of you and you guys, that passion is needed. Um, Quick, quick thing here, and I'm kind of want to talk about this because I saw this earlier and I'm going through it because again, my, my chat rooms and probably, it's, it's a, there's a lot going on here. So I'm, I apologize to anyone if I missed anything or a comment, but I'm trying to keep balance. But there was a, a, a statement here that the acceptance of vocational schools has changed so much over the years, limiting access for, stu um, for a lot of students. And I think access for students, um, period, uh, especially students of color have changed in many ways where um, structures are built, whether that be into um, vocational schools, whether that be into nursing programs after vocational schools, um, whether it be into specific programs in higher ed as well. Could we speak a little bit to that and 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 what is happening right now in in these areas and and where some of this access is denying our students um, opportunity? Uh, no. You want to start, Heather? No, you go, <laughs> go ahead. ahead. No, you go. Uh, so. My thoughts on it, Rob, are um, that, it, that it hasn't really changed all that much. So I can remember watching a documentary about the uh, New Bedford riots in the 70s, and there was a group of brothers standing outside talking about how they couldn't get into vote because they were black. And some of the Cape Verdeans were getting in because they were light skinned and they weren't getting their chances to learn a trade, even though they were promised that they would be given opportunities. So the the system behind it although it may have changed a bit over the years the results haven't really changed the, the way that they should anyway um i can think of two occasions where um one was someone that you had spoke to me about and you said hey can you look into this 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 young lady's a good kid she didn't get accepted and we found out that her attendance was awful well her attendance was awful because of home circumstances right mom wouldn't wouldn't let her walk to school but mom also wouldn't get up on time to bring her to school so here's a kid who's not going to get in because of horrible attendance but when we spoke to uh the director of guidance at the time they were able to help this young lady out and she became a contributor to our school where she wasn't just a kid who came into a classroom every day she was involved in athletics she became a member of the student body and that's a student that otherwise would not have had the opportunity because of circumstances outside of their control and so kind of like Missy was talking about MCAS, the system is flawed. Although like it had the best of intentions probably, the, the system doesn't, doesn't benefit our students the way that it should. And um, we can th think of another student um, who was a great contributor to our school as well and, and a great basketball player. He didn't get in because of attendance as well. Well, come to find out, they didn't give him um, some, uh, they didn't give him those uh, excused absences because he had a medical issue. Mom turned in that paperwork, but if not for, for mom advocating and asking why, 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 this student would have lost out on that opportunity as well. So the other piece too is if a kid doesn't have someone who's gonna advocate for them when, when uh, there's an issue or to just find out what the problem is, then that student is just left behind. Uh, and again, vocational education isn't for everyone, just like the world of uh, academia isn't for everyone. So we have to find and put systems in place that really um, put our, our children in the best positions to succeed. Is it possible that you can also speak to how 
Um, the closing down of fashion design is a disservice to our female and minority um, community. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we can we can touch on that. So at our specific school, they're they're closing down two shops, and one of them is the fashion design shop. And um, through through some uh, um, community engagement, there's been a, a Save Our Shops campaign put together. And the fashion design shop here, we have an industry that um, in my opinion, um, more than a lot of other industries that we teach at our school, gives our students an opportunity to be entrepreneurs. And so we have a, a, a shop that has a high female popula population and included in that female population is a high minority population. And we're closing a shop that gives them opportunities to be entrepreneurs, you know? How, how, how are we benefiting our kids by making some of these decisions. I'll add to that, that the, the shop closing um, is largely a real estate move to open predominantly uh, shops that will pre predomin predominantly service white males. Um, so it's putting our, our, our numbers, our, 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 the, our minority populations in jeopardy at the, for more opportunities for white young men to go to Vogue. So um, the only thing I would say about vocational admissions in addition to what Serge said and some of the people in the chat said it's very competitive. They are blind admissions. That means we don't know who has IEPs, um, who has 504s coming in the door. We look at um, attendance, discipline, and grades. Um, and the problem is the number of seats. If you have an institution that houses only 500, but services three communities or five communities or six communities, there has to be some sort of system. Um, even if we were to go to a lottery system, which many of our state legislatures are arguing in favor of, that's not gonna guarantee the right kids get into the building. So I think the answer is to look at the sending districts and for the state to offer those districts the funding to open those programs for the students that are going to those schools. Um, all schools should offer all of these opportunities that service their students in the best possible ways would be my only two cents on that. Thank you, guys. This is such this is such a great thing. I have a, a general private question that just came on, and this could go to any of the panels as well. As I'm trying to follow this the order, can you think of innovative approaches in all levels of education um, uh, to equity and how we can come together as a community to foster transformative change? Can I say something? Can I chime in? Yeah. Um, there's a tweet that's going on Twitter. Everybody knows about Black Twitter. It's, it's, um, and it says, white people, how many of you have been the only white person in the room? And so it's talking about professional white people. When in your professional life have you been the only white person in the room? And there were a lot of comments saying, you know, that probably never happens. When does that happen? Maybe if they work at an HBCU, maybe if they work in a, a certain um, uh, community, then that might be be um, something that can say true. And then it said black people and Latino people, how many times have you been the only black or brown person in the room? And, and it went crazy because every time, all the time, this has always happened to me. And so I think we really need to begin from leadership. Um, we need to have people at the table who are able to speak to the experiences that a lot of our students, no matter where, K through 16, we have to have individuals who can speak to the experiences of a lot of our students. Um, you know, there are a lot of resources out there for uh, people to go work in low incomes, lower socioeconomic areas, you know, maybe if you don't have a teaching degree, you can go do a program and work for five years. Um, you can get your student loans um, waived if you go work in certain areas and things of that nature. But the problem is, is that we still have to encourage our black and brown um, individuals to step up and to get into positions where they can make the change and that they can be the voice. As Kevin said, and Kevin and I used to work together, um, and we were on a committee once, and 
myself and another person said, you know, I'm tired of being the black voice all the time. Like that, that, that becomes draining sometimes, but I knew I had to do it. I had to do it for the students. I had to do it for the, we only, I only had a few colleagues that looked like me, unfortunately at that institution, but I had to, I had to do it. I had to muster up the strength to go ahead and do it. And I said, so I think the first thing we have to do, Rob, to your question is that we have to make sure that people are at the table who can speak to the experiences. And then if we don't have people at the table who can speak to experiences, we need to inter, um, interact more with the people that we're serving, our students, our families and so forth and figure out what their needs are and what we need to do to address those needs. And they don't know what they don't know. A lot of times we have, in, especially a lot of our immigrant populations that are coming in, they don't understand what, their need, what they need or don't need. And so we need to be able to educate them as a family and not just sometimes a student. We need to educate everyone um, in order to see any type of change. Can I chime in right after Shauna? Um, it kind of speaks to what Shauna was trying to say uh, with the, 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 the familiar approach, right? As a family, I think uh, we sometimes get a little bit too caught up with the idea that addressing equity has to be a, a methodological established institutional norm. Uh, and maybe it doesn't have to be, maybe it is a lot more basic and, and um, primal than that. Uh, it's, it's rooted in family. It's rooted in love. Uh, and I'm going to echo Martin Luther King and Cornell West in, in how they emphasize uh, the idea that social justice is what love looks like in public. Um, so again, they, they go back to this idea of an emotional engagement with equity, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of room and there's a lot of opportunity in the arts, in humanities, in performance arts, in theater, in literature, where we can begin to create conditions where everyone can begin to relate to an emotion, where they could hold on to this idea of looking at equity and justice, not just as a norm, but as a, as a force that is like desire, that is rooted in, in love and community and family, I think that is, it's not in, innovative, it's, it's very elementary and basic. It, it's who we are as, as living beings, right? We hold on to emotions, you know, things that really matter to us. They're not just logical things that make sense. They're things that are illogical and don't make sense at all. And yet that's what makes them really powerful. And that really drives people for accomplishing it. You know, when you're in love, you do anything for that person, right? So I think maybe we could begin to create opportunities for folks to see this this cause, this 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 um, equity uh, as as a as a desire, something to to love rather than something to just understand and accomplish as a norm or a method or a policy. It is it is a bit more than that. It is it is an emotion. It's a desire. So that's my piece. Can I add something? Um, I think it's also important to recognize that equity work is intersectional. So um, it's important to recognize that like all these things intertwine. So there's LGBTQ issues, there's disability issues, there's feminism issues, there's all different issues that, and race, and obviously race is at the center of it, but they also branch off to other um, areas. And um, I often see people who are kind of doing work in a certain area then kind of be hateful in another area. And it's like, well, if you're not embracing equity as a whole and kind of um, acknowledging the intersectionality of it, then you're not really doing the work, right? I think that, it, that it, it, you have to encompass all areas of equity for all people. That is powerful. Um, Anybody else want to chime in on that? Or any other innovative ways? Okay. So I just want to tell you how powerful, and I, I've used the word powerful a hundred times today because that's what I feel. And if, if you look at the chat, it's exploding. My private chats is exploding and it still is at this moment, but I have to be cautious of time um, for everyone. What's great about these series and what we're looking to do 
um, right now, I'm just going to kind of really kind of get us into that wrapping, um, wrapping up. And if people want to stay after, um, we can stay a couple of minutes after the fact. But I wanted to kind of really get through just to be aware of people's time. It's summertime, dinner time. We got small children. We got all types of things going on. So I just wanted to be con uh, conscious of that. Um, Melissa, if you mind, um, just kind of putting up PowerPoint. So our next thing here is, is what we're going to talk about is our actionable items. And, and these are from, from our forum participants. So I'm going to go, um, it's we're doing a little bit different. Usually I just kind of repeat things. Um, and I want us to kind of really um, have a, a, a brief conversation. So when I go to your um, slide of some of the items you did, if you can just do a brief, you know, run through of your, of your items there, um, it's a good way to kind of plug some of your work. One thing that we do in these forums is we really, really, really want people to understand that we are looking for change. We're not just here to have a conversation. We're looking at how you can influence your areas and influence your circles of change. And how do we do that? So each one of our forums, you'll see, we'll send, we're sending you guys newsletters. And in those newsletters, we're having books that you can read, um, different templates you can use in your classrooms, um, different you know, motivational videos. We're sending all different areas of things to kind of really help you with whatever subject that we're on. This is the first of the educational inequity. Um, as you can see, we were talking very holistic and very broad today. But in the future, we're gonna get, we're gonna be very, very, very intent. So we're gonna really look at some of the intent pieces and that could be, you know, one of these social forms will be within just maybe one structure or one culture or whatever it may be when we're talking about edu in edu educational inequities, right? Because sometimes, you know, as an educator, you sit back and you don't really, you don't understand like, how can I help this particular demographic of student? Um, and we wanna really kind of get to that. And some of our forms will help us set us up for doing that in the future, because these will be ongoing. Um, one thing that we will be doing in the future, and as you see, a lot of these will be led by different groups and different professionals, so that we are not just only hearing it from me, but you're hearing it from the people who do the work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, Melissa, could you go to the next slide, please? So, this is um, was shared to us by um, by Amy Dos Santos. So, uh, Amy, would you kind of just briefly just go over some of the stuff that you have here for the audience? Yeah. Um, so, I those are a list of books. Um, you know, I think oftentimes teachers will say to me that I've you know had discussions with over the year that they don't have the time to talk about diversity and remote race um, in their classroom because they have a curriculum they have to follow and they have all this other items that need to be taken care of um, but to that I kind of push back and say you can incorporate it so I found um, a lot of different multicultural read alouds that you know, as a teacher, I know that I have to work on comprehension. I know that I have to be reading books to the students. So what's wrong with reading a book that has diversity promotion and it that can act as a, it, it can cover both bases, right? So I can both be doing my job as a teacher, making sure I'm covering standards, um, but I can also then double on that and be able to promote diversity there. So this is uh, a list of uh, books that I've read, that I have, that I own, they're great. Um, I don't know if it's on this slide, but I know that I've also sent to Melissa um, a list of different games uh, and activities. There's lesson plans. There's just a lot of resources. Oh, here it is. Um, these are lots of different games that are appropriate for all ages of elementary. Um, there's websites that have uh, passages for different grade levels, um, lesson plans, activities. Um, to try to take some of the work of it. I, I've had colleagues say, I don't have time to plan this. I don't have time to do that. And so here it is, you know, here's some things that you can do that, that eliminates that well legwork for you. No, thank you so much. A little feedback there. Is somebody saying something? No. So again, thank you for that. And again, I think that is one of the things we don't have time. People say, you know, how can I have time? So we're providing that for you and Amy, I appreciate uh, you giving us some of those resources for some of the elementary um, teachers that are going that are in this form and we'll see it recorded as well. Um, so next we have uh, Dr. Sarah Madeiras and some of the resources that she have. Could you talk a little bit about that, I'm Sarah? 
Yep. Um, so the first resource I listed is actually um, a shameless plug. It's my, my podcast I have with my friend Stephanie, who also has her doctorate in um, education, leadership, and policy. Um, and it's kind of more of like a laid back way that we talk about exactly. I mean, we talk, we talk about all the issues that we've talked about in this forum today. And we dive pretty deep. We've done about like seven episodes so far. Um, and it just, it was just kind of a way to kind of like this forum was just to kind of get the information out there and to kind of like read people. Um, I know that I, like Amy just said, I often hear teachers say, well, I don't have time to read about this, or I don't have time to learn about this. So, you know, Stephanie and I had, had talked last summer and we were like, I'm so tired of hearing that teachers don't have time. They don't have time. So we were like, let's package this up and put it on a podcast for them so they could just throw their earphones in and and they can um, they can learn something. Um, we put a ton of research into every single episode. Um, you know, we usually take a few weeks before we record, and we we really it's it's not just our opinions. It's a lot of um, facts, or we provide resources and stuff. Um, there's I, I listed a Facebook group that I moderate. It's called Culturally, Culturally Conscious Action Educators, um, and it's just it's a group that you know it's all over the country, um, and it just you know we we often will have like theme weeks where like one week only black people can post and they kind of educate other people and, the, and white people are only there to listen. Um, like for example, next week we're doing like disability awareness where myself and other people from the disability community or special educators will be posting. So um, it's kind of just, you're already on social media. You're already going to be on your phone. You're going to be on Facebook or Instagram, or whatever. And I, I think it's important to just kind of, um, it's, it's another way to kind of help you know make your spaces more um more informative um and then i just included a, a you know these are these are just books that i usually recommend to my colleagues when they ask where to start um i think these are great starting points um the guide for white women who teach black boys is probably my favorite one uh, i read this about maybe like a year or two ago and um it's it's big but my my advice to you though is when you read any book that has to do with education or anything like this I, I think it's good to read with another person. So I actually have a book club on, on Facebook. It's called South Coast Mass Book Club for Action Educators. Or you can email me if you want me to like add you and I can give you the Zoom link. Um, but you don't even have to do that. If you find like, um, you know, if you find a colleague that's like-minded and, and you're like, or, or if you just want to engage, you know, a group of educators that you think could use this knowledge, it's good to read it together because when you read a book alone, you're not really diving deep, I feel like. I feel like when you read with somebody else and you discuss that, you can really dive deep and create a plan of how to move forward. Thank you so much. And again, this is extremely helpful. Kevin, um, will you do us the honor and talk about your book and, and uh, some of the things that you're doing as well? Sorry, probably help if I unmute myself there. Um, yeah, so I wrote this book basically to try to answer my own and other questions about given everything that's going on, and this was even pre-pandemic, like how do we say that what we're doing is ultimately a practice grounded in hope? And so I try to talk about, you know, this idea of radical hope, you know, radical in the root level fundamental sense. And it's written, you know, out of my own experiences in higher education, but I, you know, it might have things to say that resonate with folks, you know, who are doing this work, you know, uh, K to 12 or other educational settings too. And, you know, mostly it's, you know, it's kind of a manifesto, but kind of a love letter to teaching as well and, and to students. And so if, if folks read it and it resonates, I'd, I'd be super honored. Um, but yeah, it just, and, and what I said in the beginning of this session kind of, you know, comes out of the thinking I was doing for that book. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we appreciate it. We're, we're going to use it as we're starting a um, social justice book club and, and it's definitely on our list. And so we'll get to that at some point this year with our social justice book club group. So uh, thank you for that. And we'll do our best to promote it as, as, as that. And so if anyone wants to go get it, go get it. Where can they get the book? Is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. Uh, West Virginia University Press's website has a page for the Teaching and Learning in Higher Ed series. Um, so yeah, my editor thanks you uh, for the shout outs. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, next slide there, Melissa. So um, Engen, we want to talk a little bit about your uh, pedagogical references that you have. Yeah, sure. Um... Um, well, some of the stuff that I've tried to convey today, the idea of building relationships, uh, diversifying the curriculum, 
looking at assessment and other artifacts in the classroom that are more inclusive and, and, and opens up discussions of diversity and social justice and how to empower student identities. I'm not making it all up, right? So this is the research. These are the, the icons, the canons of the so-called critical pedagogy and culturally relevant teaching. Uh, I'm surprised you put all that re <laughs> reference up there. Um, I've done my dissertation on multicultural ed. I've actually critiqued it, uh, which is a, another side topic if you guys are interested in looking at the critique of social justice education. But these are the icons of uh, critical pedagogy and culturally relevant teaching. And there's a lot of good stuff out there that gives you lots of tools to think about and, and try to implement in the classroom on, on fostering inclusion and, and creating dialogues that are uh, much needed. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. So just you know, some of our final thoughts. Um, again, I saw this uh, quote, as you guys can read it, on the uh, New York Times today. Um, and it was, it was shared by um, uh, Connie Cabello, um, Cabello, who was the uh, vice president um, from uh, diversity from Framingham University. And it was actually from the New York Times. And it's very, very relevant. And it says, you must um, also study the, to learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this, in this soul-wrenching existential uh, struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change, and that is why the answers worked um, out so long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Um, continue to build union between movements, stretching across the globe because we must pay our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Um, and I think, again, that's from the New York Times and, and that's something I saw earlier today. Um, as, we, as we move along and we're, we're continuing to do this work, as you just heard some of, the, um, some of the materials that you can utilize, obviously we don't want to drown you in information that you can't, it's hard to keep up with. So part of our mission is to make sure that we are doing it intentionally and then on time. So every few weeks and every so often, we will send you out reminders. So that way this work is purposeful and it's not forgotten because I think a lot of times we sit down in these conversations and we, sit and we feel great and empowered and then a couple of weeks later, it's really, where are we? And then we forget about it. So it's my job and, and the people here at Bristol to, to really, you know, we, we, we preach the equity agenda and these are things that we really truly believe in. This is where we're going to um, help our community, um, which was powerful to see so many people from our New Bedford, Taunton, Attleboro, New Bed um, I said New Bedford, uh, Fall River, um, and our other, Fair Haven, all our local, Dartmouth, all our local areas really representing uh, here our Bristol County areas. Um, and it's important for us to continue and carry this conversation um, moving forward. Um, next slide there. So as we all know, our, um, we've now checked, this is our third checkbox of, of, uh, of social justice forums. And today, uh, our next one will be on um, August 27th, which is, I believe I have my thing in the front of the way, of course I do, women's rights, uh, race and women's rights, and forgive me, we have so many different things that are, um, and we're gonna have our um, director of the Women's Center leading this particular one as we start getting into the different um, mo modalities here and the different parts of uh, social justice, I want to really have those leaders within our college community also leading these programs. We're also gonna have some, um, we're gonna have some of our work also done with our, our unions in our schools so that we're gonna see our unions stepping up and working with them as we are right now looking at different trainings and opportunities for social justice. Um, and this is really important work because I think um, as we spoke, we don't want to be the only individual who's doing it. We want our college community to really buy in and accept what we're doing. And that's what I'm looking to do. And that's how I'm going to influence my change is to really, you know, partner and work, not just throw it on someone's lap, but partner and work. And so that way we can create these forms and have it become sustainable and ongoing as we move, as we move forward. Uh, next slide. So again, if you have to uh, contact us, in our newsletters, we, you, know, you have our contact information, but a lot of our panelists will have like email addresses and other opportunities where you can uh, communicate with them as well, especially whatever level of teaching you are. 
or if you know someone um, out in the community who can benefit from this video, please share it with them. Um, we probably will have this um, done within the next two weeks because we do have to get it captioned. And once that is done, we will send it out in one of our upcoming newsletters. Um, and then when you do that, it will you know, really help benefit another individual who's looking to maybe help their classroom. And then that's how you can, their classroom or even their workspace. And this is how you can influence change because maybe I'm, we're preaching to the, to the choir here. Maybe everybody here really gets it. Um, and, but we know we all work with people who just, you know, they're a little naive to what we were speaking about today. And we want to have that opportunity in order for, um, for us to help influence change and not be implicit by our silence. Let's really, complicit by our silence, let's really have our, an opportunity to really um, impact change for our students because they need it. They look to us as, they look to us as, um, as, as, you know, people that they look up to us, plain and simple. And because they look up to us, we wanna make sure that we're able to influence as much as we can and show them the way so that way they can have the same opportunities that we may have had um, in our educational journeys and beyond. Um, so again, I wanna thank every single person for this. Um, I really truly appreciate you. Um, and if anybody has any comments, we can stay on, but we will sign off. And uh, panelists, I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you again. Uh, Engen, I won't call you doctor, I'll say Engen. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Shanna, Kevin, Amy, Sarah, Missy, um, uh, Heather, and Serge for, for your work in doing this and meeting with me. I know I was a pain in the butt having these meetings. And then I also would like to thank uh, Professor Robin Worthington for helping me with some of the slides and making sure that we have some factual information um, there. And especially I want to thank uh, Melissa, who keeps me organized and on track. Um, because that is hard to do. And thank you, uh, Communications and John Forenoff for helping me with a lot of the art and things that we have as well. So again, it's a huge collection of people that are contributing here. And, and that's how we create change, is by creating a community and, and moving forward. So thank you guys, God bless, and I see you August 27th.